And we'll start with uh, this bus, a good old uh, friend of ICAD. And uh, you're Mark in there, right? Yes. I'm Mark, go ahead. Hey. So good afternoon, everybody. And I'm going to talk about uh, this one, the internet platform in deep learning application. And this is mainly a talk um, on how to bring different users, different devices over some internet web server to deep learning infrastructure. But let me start with some um, motivation. So on this conference, we had a lot about how deep learning can improve analysis, how deep learning can improve measurement. And this is more or less here on the top part. And uh, we get some data, you put it into analysis, and you get some measurements out of your data. But of course, while well, this is only the top of the iceberg, but you have underneath, you have also to think about hardware and system. Of course, data does not come without detectors. Analysis does not work without computing resources and software resources. But then finally, of course, you have the printed version of the journals. So, and I want to speak about how, uh, about different things here in the resources part below the water surface of the iceberg. And well, this is a question about how to make deep learning resources accessible. So you have the resources here on the right hand side, which is mainly software and different frameworks, which I don't care so much about because other people write them for me. And then there's hardware, and I can also buy hardware if I have enough money. And well, I have typically a lot of users, but I have somehow to combine them or to make, uh, well, give them somehow a way how they can arrive from the left hand side to the right hand side. And in the middle, well, you have some things. You could call it obstacles, or you could also call them uh, well, some things you have come to combine to get some good access to the resources and well, just give you some keywords. The users have to share the resources on a multi user system. How can the users authenticate on the system, load balancing, operating system, and drivers? Okay, this brings me to the outline of the talk. So we'll talk about three things. The uh, VISPA software, um, then we have a local cluster in Athens, and our experiment is with the combination of both of them. Let me start with the VISPA software. This is an environment inside the web browser, and it provides some standard tools for web environment. Um, on top of remote resources, you have a file browser with upload and download. You have also some terminal, and you see some HTOP. Inside the terminal, and you have a code editor which allows you to write code. Um, and you can also execute the code, so there's an execution area in this code editor, and I will come back to this later. And you have also some preview area where you can see some plots. In general, this is an extensible framework, and I will talk about some more extensions later. Let me come to the technical concept behind this one. So, on the left hand side, you have again the client with different um, devices from mobile phones to tablets, uh, over tablets to well, normal computers. And on the right hand side, you have the computing resources, which we call workspaces. And in the middle, we have the Visual Server instance. And to, uh, to lower the barrier, we start uh, on, the, or we just have an HTML and JavaScript on the client side. The server is written in Python, and for the connection to the workspace, everything is written in Python plus anything uh, else. So the user connects via HTTP, HTTPS, HTTP, sorry for that, uh, to the server, and then the server connects to any remote computing resources you like via SSH and remote procedure for this RPC. So in principle, the BISPOC concept allows a browser-based access to any computing resource. So I explained the upper part of this picture, how to bring users over the server to infrastructure. But uh, I will also talk now about applications and uh, our local setup. So we have an instance operated in the Art University, and we have also a workspace operated. And I will talk about the workspace and which steps we have to take to allow the user and easy start up with deep learning applications. First of all, let's talk a little bit about the cluster. So the cluster has operated since 2012, and the system has successfully been used for outreach 
research and education purposes. And uh, last year we bought 10 new machines for deep learning with each 2 gigabytes and 80 gigabytes of RAM and 80 CPU cores. Um, we have some storage which we can mount via NFS. And for this, we use shared home. You can sort of experiment the data as normal and work us from scratch. Then here's the dedicated whisper server, which was in the middle of the picture before. And we have got a CPU cluster with 16 times 8 cores. So now we have the cluster, we have the server, we have the users. But somehow, the users have to authenticate from the cluster. Um, and we have developed a transparent approach to get the most ex interactive experience. And uh, this approach allows a simultaneous registration on the web server and on the cluster. So the client just uh, registers on the server. And for this, he stores his credentials in the database, which is in our case the MariaDB database, which was formerly known as MySQL. And while for the SH connection, there's a user account needed on the cluster, and this works um, via an LDAP server. And this LDAP server is feeded by the MariaDB from the Discord server. So we have synchronization between these two databases, and then we can check the credentials. And by this, we have the same password on the server and on the cluster. So we can get an automatic process connection to the default workspace. The Step Club allows also to have different user groups, like local research groups, students, or guests. Um, OK, now the next step is the user wants to run jobs on the cluster, of course. And for this, we have to talk about job scheduling. Um, so we allow small interactive jobs on the login node. So the user is connected over the server to, log to some login node. But on this node, um, we allow, as I said, only small interactive jobs. And we do some resource distribution using HT Condor, so that we have some fair share of our resources. So the, uh, the jobs are submitted from this login node to every node end. And we have dynamic slots for research jobs. So um, the jobs, um, the slots are not fixed size, but they can have any size that fits on the machine. This is some special feature of HD Condor. And another feature of HD Condor, which is quite recent, is that you can also request GPUs and implement that. And our GPUs are only available via Condor so that nobody tries to start up on the login nodes via and hook some GPUs and blocks the machine. Then we implemented some automatic job generation script, which allows the submission for not so much experienced users. But it has also some arguments to uh, precisely define your jobs. And with this script, we can have a direct submission from the code editor extension. So the user sees the code editor in the web browser, writes the code, and can directly submit his jobs to our local Conda cluster. And then we have some tail on the output. And this is also shown in the code editor. And this gives you some interactive feeling on your running job. And of course, this lowers the entry barrier because I don't have to care about how much software installation, how do I start the job, and many other things. And this brings me to, to experiment, experiments or experiences we made. And this is a big data workshop in the university class. The big data workshop um, was in actual particle physics and was held in January this year. And it was deep learning hand tutorials, tutorial um, for three days in Aachen and we had roughly 70 users. And they only need the web browser to execute all the examples and to work on some deep learning examples. And during the university class, well, this was on master level, and it was for the entire semester. And there were about 50 users. And they produced some heavy load peaks because everybody tends to start to work on the exercises like one or a half day before they be handed in. So we had some heavy load peaks. And um, these classes had some increasing computational requirements over the semester. And uh, the feedback we got from both exper experiences that uh, everybody was happy that he did not have to care about which version of Keras does it work with which software version of TensorFlow, how do I can access GPU 
and everybody could concentrate on the deep learning task and had not to worry about some, let's say, more technical requirements. Of course, we're also doing research on the WISPA cluster, and this brings me to some extensions. So we have a parameter screen extension, and this works um, by exploring files which are written by parameter scan. So typically, if you write files for parameter scan, you enter somehow your parameters in the file names. And this extension allows to reflect these file names by some regular expressions and generate automatically some sliders so that you can comfortably switch between different parameters and get a good overview of what, what parameter does change what in your analysis. And with your analysis, uh, this extension can at present uh, display anything what can be displayed in the browser, so images, PDF, or text, or HTML, or whatever. And some really recent active development, which is not yet in the beta stadium, tensor board integration for visualization of information gathered by TensorFlow. And uh, as I said, this is an active development. Okay, this brings me already to my summary. So, as I said, as I explained, this provides access to remote computing resources. It allows the visualization in the browser, or has the visualization in the browser. It successfully employed in research, education, and outreach. And as a punchline, which you can remember from this talk, is that WISPA plus our cluster set up in Aachen provides seamless access to deep learning infrastructure. And uh, we have also some guest accounts with limited resources available. So you can register on the cluster and try it out. We have also a repository to set up uh, your own account <coughs> and you can also find some more information on uh, this link. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Mark. And this by is fast. So we have plenty of time. What would be a good example for a model application running? Um, you mean the deep learning application? Or I mean, the system provides model, access to the model device. Right? Yeah. I wonder what kind of uh, application would Well, no, we do not run on the mobile. We run on. I can go back to story. We run on some separate workspace. And we only have an interface uh, which is run in the browser, so everything is just displayed in the browser, mm -hmm. but the code is run on some dedicated workspace here in this case. So you can if it will run anything, also you can just check on your, I don't know, TTX or whatever. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so the environment that you land on when you SSH to that machine and RPCs, so is that always the same or are you able to? Uh, you know, offer a different kind of environment? Right. In principle, uh, we offer some default workspace um, so that everybody can get easily started, but everybody can use any workspace which is accessible. So you can use, I don't know, some turn machines or your local computing department machines. You just need an SSH account there because we cannot provide an SSH account. So the, the, the setup is that you kind of SSH is really like bare metal machine. I'm thinking of because this is very similar to like these online IDEs that are container based, and so you might think about offering like a workspace where the user can say, okay, I want to like drop into the container environment uh, that has like all the software installed. Yeah, okay. And that container can like run the application demon, so probably don't have to change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, so that could be done. But we thought the principal step is that you can edit eggs in your favorite environment. Because there are so many environments already set up, and everybody that they are more happy with this environment. So just having edit eggs as a requirement is pretty low requirement. The, the, the browser uh, interface looks very similar to JupyterLab. Have, have you looked at that, or yeah. you need some integration with it? Um, we looked at that. Um, actually, um, first of all, we were in time before Jupyter Lab, so we developed it, I don't know, two to three years before Jupyter Lab came up. Um, then, of course, uh, due to the fact that Jupyter Lab offers somehow, if I'm not wrongly informed, um, some default workspace with just limited resources, 
um, at least if you don't have it just set it right. Well, let's, let's talk about the server. I'm talking about the browser. Yeah, okay. And, and the browser uh, environment is very extensive. Of course, yeah. it's, that's not that's not really released yet. It's, it's pretty alpha, but I really like it. Yeah. Great great way to provide an interface to any any kind of resources. Yeah, the browsers are just so capable. Yeah, okay, that, that's true. And I, I probably they use a similar tool that we use, but uh, I'm not so much familiar with Jupyter things. But more questions? Which computer library do you use? But it's um, you use uh, if you don't know by heart, don't worry. I'll mean, yeah, send you an email the and then read that in name. We use a uh, bootstrap in the background. Um, yeah. The rest is written by ourselves. Oh, okay. And um, suppose this thing, you know, your analysis code crashes on the node. How would you do? Well, if the analysis code crashes, I usually get some feedback via, for example, condo, so there's an error file written. Sometimes I can look into this error file, and because I can, I can turn it and I have a high browser, so I can just put any file I like, and then I can get, like on my local desktop yeah. computer, yeah. all information. Okay, any more questions? That's it. Thank you.